Welcome again, everybody, to John's Briefs. I'm very grateful, Mark, for you coming and spending time and giving us this education. Uh, today, I want to talk about, we've got a couple of videos, we'll put some links in the description to them, uh, of people defending themselves in their home. Um, and, and really, I want to talk with you today, Mark, about the, the kind of space between your home and just outside your home, what legally is usually defined as your curtilage. So let's talk about the difference in defending ourselves in these different spaces. Today's video is brought to us by the generosity of Firearms Legal Protection. Firearms Legal Protection is a legal defense program for lawful gun owners. You win the fight and they will help you win the fight after the fight for the rest of your life. There's a link in the description for a coupon code for a discount for all active self-protection watchers. So Mark, can you lay out for us quickly kind of what the idea is, the difference between being in public and being in my home? <clears throat> well, for what purpose, I guess? For self-defense, the, the purpose of self-defense. Yeah, um, the same rules apply generally. And so uh, I think a lot of people erroneously believe that if the incident happens in their home, it's sort of a free-for-all. Right, can do I do whatever, whatever they, I want. They can do whatever they want. Someone's in their home and yeah. they think that's the case. That's really not the case. Um, on the other hand, I don't think it's it's accurate to say it's exactly the same either because in your home you get a little bit more discretion I think you get a little bit more um, and this is just this is not something that I'm saying based on really what the law says this is what I'm saying based on just 25 years of experience in terms of defending these types of cases and so when somebody's in your home you know that's your your home is your castle even in the states where you you have to retreat before you use self-defense, as you know, the castle doctrine, um, you still don't have to retreat because it's in your home. Right. And so you get a little bit more uh, maybe forgiving analysis because it occurs in your home. Now, the public, you know, out on the street or something, that's different analysis. It's not that you can't defend yourself no. there. You can, but um, <clears throat> a lot of prosecutors, even in states where you don't have to retreat first, will say, you know, why didn't you just walk away? Right. They'll hit you with that question and then they'll use that those types of facts to try to make it sound maybe to a jury that you were sort of looking for a problem. You were excited about pulling out your firearm. Now the curtilage is sort of in the middle, right? The curtilage is yeah. that that area that's not technically inside the house, but it's, you know, maybe like a um, your front porch. Yeah, like a front <clears throat> porch or even a little bit further if right. you maybe have an internal gate. Some homes have an, a gate and then mm -hmm. people walk through and then they get to yeah, the courtyard front door, or something. A courtyard area, something like that. And I can just tell you for most of Fourth Amendment analysis, which uh, for those who aren't familiar with that is your protection against unreasonable, your constitutional mm -hmm. protection against unreasonable searches and seizures. For Fourth Amendment analysis, generally speaking, the curtilage is like your home. Okay. So um, I haven't seen anything in terms of self-defense that, that treats the curtilage any different than the home. But like I've said, for the most part, the same rules apply. But as right. you know, there's lots of gray area. That's why you do these videos, right? Because we don't have bright lines. It's all about trying to predict what, as I like to say, a randomly selected group of people from the local community, read the jury, thinks is reasonable. Right. I mean, that's what it always boils down to. Where it ends to. up. It always, with the, all of this is commentary, right? The commentary for the central rule, which is you can do whatever you want so long as it's reasonable. Yeah, and you still have to act reasonably all the time. You always so, have to act reasonably. I haven't prepped Mark for this, so I'm gonna ask you if, if my idea and the way that I have thought about this makes sense to you. Okay. What, what I have always thought about, I tell people from a, a reasonable self-defense perspective, I get it. I, I really agree with stand your ground. I really think that uh, if I have a right to be somewhere, then I should be able to defend myself there. But for the perspective of a smart self-defender, I should ignore that. If I can get out of there, get out of there. Avoid every fight I can. But my home is like the last place of retreat. I don't have any more ability to retreat. I've retreated as far as I possibly can. And my curtilage is almost there because I can still go back through the door. So so I've always taught it and thought it that that... When I'm in public, if I can get out of there, get out of there because I'm smart, right? I live in a stand your ground state. You don't have to retreat in Arizona, but but I still do. I still am gonna get the heck out of there if I can because I'm smart. I don't wanna get in a gunfight. On my front porch, in my curtilage, as it were. Well, I have more control over my property and so I have less ability to get out of there, but in my home, if it's come upon me in my home, I don't have any more ability to retreat, so I kind of get more presumption that I'm acting reasonably. Yeah? I don't know if I completely go along with that because 
Um, look, most of us guys, we don't like the idea of having to retreat from your home at all, right? Because we have some... This is my space. Yeah, we, we all have egos. We're guys, right? We don't want to be running out the back door if somebody's in the house. But, but I think that for the same exact reason that you say, when I'm out in public, even though I don't have to retreat, I right. retreat. Why do you retreat? You retreat because sometimes the bad guys win and your life can't be replaced. Right. No matter what yeah. happens, your life can't be replaced. For that exact same reason, I take the position that if you can retreat from your home, do leaving so. only property, right? I mean, obviously, if the kids are in the house or something like totally that. Totally different world. Different world. But if nothing's in the house but property and sentimental stuff, all of that stuff, for the most part, can be replaced. And it's almost all, you're, it ought to be insured. All of your stuff ought to be insured in your home. Prob Should be. Probably is. <clears throat> so if you can, you can retreat from the inside of your home to the outside of your home if right. the problem is in the home, right? And so I'm not saying that even I would do that in the heat of passion, right? I'm probably going to stand my ground and maybe engage somebody in my house because after all, as you say, it's my home and I don't want to retreat from my home. But I would hope that under sort of the stress of an incident like that, I would be smart enough to say, you know what, if you want to take the TV or take whatever you want, I'm going out the back door because I don't want to be shot. And all that stuff is just an insurance claim away, as yeah, you say. If I can get away without endangering For the sure. lives of my loved ones. And I think in a lot of places, um, in a lot of states, they treat an occupied vehicle like it's your castle as well. Sure. But same thing, and people have asked me this all the time. Like somebody sticks a gun to your face and says, give me your car. Okay, man, I love my car. I really like driving my car, but I'll buy another car. You know, can I, can I throw us off the track just a tad here sure, for a moment? Sure, why not? I think people get confused between what I like to call the legal world and then a completely separate world called the moral world. Big differences. I think even just we as libertarians would make a lot more progress as libertarians and getting other people to understand our philosophy if we simply said, look, everything we're talking about as libertarians, that applies only to the legal world, yes. not to the moral world. So for example, um, when people say on the left, say the uh, Bernie Sanders of the world, they say, you know, we, we think that uh, people ought to have health care and people ought to have good educations and, and take care of the less fortunate and this and that. It's not that we disagree with that position. Sure. If you're a quality moral person, even a libertarian quality moral person, you don't really disagree with that position. No, you I want think. people to have great health care and good education. Of course we you just do. simply say that's a moral issue. Mm -hmm. We not address illegal. that in the moral world. We don't want to put that in the legal world, where the Sanders crowd want to put that in the legal world because they want to use the law to enforce their moral views about charity and things like that. Mm -hmm. What we're saying is, in fact, I like to, I've started my discussions with many of the liberals now who are far left on these issues by saying, I agree with you. Uh, you and I share the same types of goals. Where we disagree is, I got a clear idea about the legal world in the moral world, and the legal world, puts down minimum standards of things. Yes. Minimum standards. Just because the law says, to bring it back to our discussion, you don't have to retreat, doesn't mean that that's the smart course of action. The smarter thing might be retreat, of course, if you can safety, right? Mm -hmm. But just because the law says you are allowed to stand your ground and, and sort of fight the fight doesn't mean it's the smart thing to do. And I think that sometimes this all gets mashed into one, right? Because a lot of the people, the non-libertarians, their, their hearts are in the right place. They're just confusing the yep. legal world and the moral world together. If we could pull that apart and say, let's solve the moral problems in the moral world. We don't enforce our morality in the United States, or at least if you want a free society, you can't have everybody fighting over moral issues all the time because the reality is we don't all agree. We set minimum what we could even call moral standards and we call those the law. Yes. That's the legal section of morality. That's the minimum part of morality that we, we say, look, you gotta follow these rules and if you don't, there's gonna be a sanction. That's the law. So I think that just mm. because the law allows something and especially you know, for the gun, the gun guys, our crowd in the gun world to understand this, you've got to comply with the law, but 
you might be able to do something like retreat for a moment that's the smarter thing to do that the law doesn't require you to do. Yeah. Just Maybe. because it's legal to do something doesn't make it right to doesn't do. mean it's the smart thing. And I would say uh, as well, you know, you point out our, some folks, in, and I have plenty of friends on the left politically, and you say, wait a minute, you're doing this. I have friends on the right who do the same thing, just different issues. We do. I do as well. <laughs> just yeah. different issues. So, you know, I'm not poking fun at no, one that side. Both sides are trying to put their more, what I would call their moral views in into the law. The law. Yeah, yeah, it's true. Uh, which is an interesting place to be. So, okay, so we've, we've recognized that. We get this presumption in our home that usually, you said in 25 years of practice, yeah, it's pretty much the same in the curtilage. You're not going to get a whole lot of difference there. I think I've seen a couple of states that have particular legislation and statutory law about the curtilage that's not. So look at your state laws as always, right? Um, but from that perspective, I think the big thing here that I heard from you, Mark, is just because I have the legal right to do something doesn't make it right to do and doesn't make it smart to do. No so always be thinking first, what's the right thing to do and what's the smart thing to do? And I think if we think what's the morally right thing to do, what's the smart thing to do here, we almost, well, I guess I should be careful. We should seldom have significant legal problems in the self-defense realm. Yeah, I think, you know, look, we're all on the planet for a short time. Right? Make a decision. Are you one of the good guys or are you one of the bad guys? Like the guy in your video who comes in on the strong arm robbery. Yeah, yeah, and bad guy. You're a bad guy. Most of the guys in your video, bad guys. But if you've decided to be one of the good guys, the right thing's not that hard to figure out. Right? If you had a good mom, what would your mom want you to do? That's generally what the law's going to want you to do. Yeah. You know, our laws in this country, the, one of the reasons our country has been very successful is because our laws are pretty good. You know, I just recently, after 25 years of practice, took and passed the Hawaii bar exam. Congratulations. It, thank you. And it gave me a good chance to do a complete overview of almost all of our law hmm. in the United States, an entire review of American jurisprudence. And I got to tell you, there's very little I would change. Hmm. I think it's very reasonable and most, like if, for example, if you took contracts law, an area we don't talk about very well, and I explained to you the nuances of that, you would say, you know, those are pretty good rules. There's a couple, you could, you could go with rule A or rule B, they're both about the same. We got to pick a rule. Sometimes we pick rule B and maybe you say we should have picked rule A, but you could probably contract around it anyways. Yeah. It's not bad because most of it tracks common sense, right? right. Hopefully. Use, use your common sense and think, what would my neighbors think under these particular circumstances it's reasonable for me to do? And if you, if you can actually figure that out and do what's reasonable, you're fine under all circumstances, yeah. legally true. speaking. I, I don't know if you're familiar, uh, in the social media world, probably the police department that started the whole thing of police departments doing big things in the social media is the Bangor, Maine Police Department and Sergeant Tim Cotton. Oh. And he does all kinds of stuff. And his rule, and he signs off all of his posts with three things, be kind to one another, leave other people's things alone, and keep your hands to yourself. If you do those three things, you probably will not have any problems in life. And you're probably a libertarian, you're right? Probably because if you keep good. your hands to yourself, yeah. that's really all we're saying about the law most of the time, yeah. right? Keep your hands to yourself and leave other people's things alone. Life is grand. Mark, thanks so much for the info, man. All right. Thanks for having me.